So my Christian ministry, I guess, can best be summed up in a maybe a little less non-Christian thought, but the thing is that maybe I can't change the world, but I believe I can change the world with somebody through my love for Jesus. Amen. And that's Thank the you. way I've lived my life since I accepted the Lord. I'm going to bring you up to that very quickly and go through a little bit of my, my journey to that point. But um, my testimony probably is going to be a little different than many of you have heard in the past. And not bragging, but I have a great life. I've been blessed before I even know I was being blessed. And my road has been like all roads, has a few bumps in it, you know, as you go along the way. But quite frankly, it's, it's been a great life that I've had and I've led. And I think part of that really goes to understanding what it is that goes on in life and a realization that when you let go and let God be in control, yeah. it really changes what, what takes place. So, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just quickly go through a couple of phases of my life. Young, grew up in a family that brought me to church on Sunday. Didn't get involved in church. Didn't have a Bible at home. Didn't pray that much, but I knew the Lord existed. And I grew up and went all the way through the high school years. And in my senior year, this wonderful lady transferred from one state into my high school. And I met her, and uh, the flame was kindled and it's lit. And uh, we fell in love, and at that point, our next day started where we went to college. Both of us went to two different schools. And we stayed together, and we grew in our relationship. And upon graduation, a week after I graduated, we got married. And I've been married to the same wonderful lady for 48 years this past year. Awesome. <laughs> Um, once we got married, we started a new phase, and both my wife and I decided to join the Peace Corps and go to, and we went to Ethiopia. It's like the Army, when you join, you want to do something, they tell you where you're going to go. It's not necessarily where we wanted to go, but they sent us to Ethiopia, and we wanted to, as you said, we're very blessed in this world. And even back in 69, 70, we felt that we needed to understand what the rest of the world was about. So we went over to Ethiopia and spent our stay, we had our stay there. And we found out early on there was a famine and a drought first and a famine back in 69 and 70. People were dying. People would get up in the morning and be dead on the doorstep. It was just, and wheelbarrows would come by and pick them up. It was something that I had a tough time understanding, but it brought an awareness to me, which I'm going to get to at the end, is that these people didn't have any hope. They didn't know where to turn. They didn't know what was going on because they didn't know Jesus Christ who existed. And that's a situation we face around the world today. And that's one reason we're involved, I'm involved in Operation Christmas Child, because we're trying to change that one child at a time, one person at a time. But from, when we came back from the Peace Corps, obviously, you know, the real world came back in, and I joined a uh, Fortune 50 company in, uh, in sales and marketing. It was very successful. I moved from Connecticut to New York to Minnesota. And along the way, we had three beautiful daughters that God gave, God gave to us. But it was in Minnesota that my wife felt something was missing. She felt the void. And so she joined the church. And of course I joined. You know, as a good husband and father, I went with my kids. Because I thought, I mean, I'm, I'm controlling myself. I'm doing well. Things can't be any better. And then it was a Thanksgiving Day celebration. And at that Thanksgiving Day celebration, I realized that it was God that really had control of my life and had brought me to where I was. And that's really when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And how it happened was we're passing a microphone. And here I am, you know, listening to all these people who are praising the Lord for all the blessings they have been given and the troubles and the problems in the life that He's been able to carry them through. And it dawned on me that, wow, you know, I've had a great life. I, my wife in high school married, had a great career, had children, had it all. But then it just dawned on me that, you know, I wasn't in control. And the Lord had always been there. And I guess I had put the Lord on the shelf. And sometimes I think that's one of the great, greatest sins you can have, is not recognizing the Lord's presence and understanding. If you know him, you, you sin, you ask for forgiveness. But if you don't even think about it, you don't really care. <laughs> and it was just it was like a wow experience for me. 
And from that point on, I changed my whole outlook on life, that I felt that I could go out and make a difference in other people's lives through what I learned up to that point and what I started to learn in a much deeper vein as I started to become a part of Sunday school classes and Bible study and all those kind of things. So very shortly after that, we moved to uh, North Carolina. And believe it or not, I'm not a native, you know that, but I've been here for over 30 years. And it's just a great place. And I came here and I joined a church right away in Charlotte. I got involved with the youth, did a lot of mission work with the youth and something called Appalachian Service Project that you may be familiar with. The mountaintop, the three daughters, you get to really get them to understand other parts of life and try to help them and reach out and try to do things. <laughs> and at the same time, getting involved in all the churchy things that we all get involved in. I also was the founding father for the Habitat for Humanity of Matthews on North Carolina. And as the sole fundraising chairman, the Lord blessed me over eight hundred thousand dollars in my tenure. And we built uh, forty homes, uh, twenty-five homes before I left. Got the land and changed the lives of people who were in a spiral. They didn't think they had any hope to make something of themselves in this world. Yeah. And it's a great Christian ministry. It's not just you know building homes. You know, Jimmy Gardner. But, you know, it's, it's building homes for, for the Lord. And it's, it's really a great mission that we were involved in. So we did that. And then at the same time, during that period of time, my wife and I also did some mission work outside of the United States. And everywhere we went, the same thing hit us. <clears throat> the poverty, the despair, the loneliness, and the lack of understanding that there was hope or there's somebody you could put your hope in. And so as a result, uh, we then moved down here to uh, north, down here to Dayton Lake, about 14 years ago, and that's the next place next to heaven, I believe. Uh, we, we live on Dayton Lake, and we joined a church, and got actively involved with this, again with the kids with the card ministry and with the food ministry and all of those kind of things that you all are doing. And what happened though, uh, during that period of time, is that I, I did uh, leave my company. I was involved in, didn't have a job. I woke up one morning, don't ask me why, I said, I'm, I, I'm living after 24 years. I'm, I'm tired, I don't want to do it anymore. Well, I said, what are you going to do? I said, no clue. But I knew that the Lord would walk me through and help. And that's where the strength I started to gain. And when I did that, I ended up starting my own consulting firm through all the people that I had known in 24 years that came up to me and try to support me and never, never advertised, never did anything. And my business grew and it was a great business. It's very small for two business. You know, my, I finally said I had my own hand today, but I did my own little business and I enjoyed life and it was great. And during that time, I also ran into the big C word. And uh, again, you know, my wife was concerned, the kids were concerned. I said, it's on my hand. You know, I, I can't control what goes on. The Lord's in Today I'm cancer free, 100. Right. I'm sure a lot of you have been there. All those things continue to happen in my life, and it all came to being because I start to understand and study the scriptures. I'm not quite as well versed as many of you in here, but I read, I study, I participate, and I try to use what I do and how I act and say most of. Okay. to share my Christian belief and my Christian faith. Uh, I don't evangelize in the street corners and those kind of things, but it's through how I act, what I say, and how I interact with people that makes a big difference. Um, and my desire really is to spread the word of the Lord of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ throughout the world. And it said in a couple of things that I've, uh, I read, it said, we are never finished with our calling until every person in the world has an opportunity to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to offend anybody here as I talk about this next couple of things. I know we have some sensitive thoughts, but take Randolph County. My research says there's 150 churches in Randolph County. There are seven Christian schools, not <coughs> all of the school churches and you know, Sunday school or the nursery schools or whatever that are out there and all 
Catholic churches. There are 28 Christian outreach ministries that are registered, of which I didn't see yours on there. Okay, but there's 28, so I know there's probably 100, you know, for all the people that don't go through all the, you know, putting down that web. There's a whole bunch of publications to read, there's Christian radio, there's more than enough Christian television, I guess you call it Christian television, mm -hmm. yeah, and there's a lot of websites. So you have to be living under a rock in a deep, deep cave, mm -hmm. not to know that the Lord Jesus Christ exists in that homecoming. But it really is your decision whether to accept the Lord or not. And we should never turn our back in any lost soul. That's our job. We right. should bring everybody we can to understand the value and the beauty of being part of Jesus' family. With that being said, I'm thinking when you look at other areas of the world where they don't even know, they can't even make that choice. You know, it brings tears to my eyes, frankly. I've been in the a long time. It, it chokes me up, especially when you see what's going on. And somebody, how many people have been out of the country on mission work? And you, then you know when you go to these countries what it's like. And, Living that life and not realizing that there is hope is really tough. So that really brought me to uh, where I am today from the perspective that our church, um, Chandler's Grove United you know, Methodist Church down in uh, Bay in New London, they have a uh, shoebox ministry. I'm sure a lot of you do. I'm going to ask that question later. But I wasn't able to go, but my wife went to the collection center, the processing center in Charlotte. And when she went, Early on, when we got to the church, she went, and they tell you who you're packing your box, what country you're packing your boxes for. Guess what country they were packing your boxes for? Ethiopia. Ethiopia. And there was a young man who had received the box and gave his testimony to Ethiopia. And my wife was able to talk to him in native language because we did know a little bit, a little bit of it, even though it was many years later. But there's no points, and that just set my heart in a position that said, I got to do this. Yeah. There's no way that that could have happened 48 years later. Or 40, actually not 48, but 44 years later. Okay. And so when I did retire uh, in 2011, I decided to start looking and working with Operation Fisher's Child. Now, I want to give you some amazing facts about OCC. I think it's important. <coughs> All seen these boxes, and you have it. I hope you will as you go through and uh, this evening. Uh, but this is the box, usually, or some facsimile that are that are packed. And the impact that this box has on a child is phenomenal. So let me give you some some numbers. Unlike what we're saying in the beginning, here there are thousands. No, since 1973, I gotta read this. To 2017, a hundred. 50 million shoeboxes have been packed and shipped to children struggling to overcome the effects of poverty, disease, famine, and war. And in 2011, 2010, OCC, or Operation Christian Child, put together a 12-week Bible study that's conducted by over 480 trained either teachers or missionaries to the children who receive those boxes. And when they do the mathematics and they go through what happens, they all come in, they go through the session, and they either they do or don't accept the Lord. Last year alone, the average is two children per minute, somewhere in the world, have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoa. And I don't know where else you can have that kind of an impact. Not because I'm really interested in OCC, but that, that's just phenomenal. Two children every minute. And they did the numbers and it all makes sense. Now, the thing beyond that, though, is for every box that's given to a child, and they understand that it comes through and it introduces them to Jesus Christ, five other individuals, other than that child, are also introduced. Jesus Christ through their friends, their family members, their communities. So when you think about it, and they've done the numbers, that's 750 million 
people have been introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ through the shoe boxes. Now, how many people have converted? No one knows because you can't figure it out now. Just you plant the seed and the Holy Spirit grows that seed and you try to accept it. You know. But that's part of it. So that, that that's really what we're here about tonight is the power and the excitement that we can give to children outside of, you know, we have a lot of children here that need help. But trust me, the kids over here are like millionaires when we put them over in these third worlds. And mm -hmm. we, most people realize that. I have been there, I've read about it, I've seen it. You see it on TV, they're tear jerkers, you know, and you wonder how can it be, and these kids are running through garbage cans to try to find a meal. It works. Matter of fact, we're over there, we're chewing, we were chewing gum, and we through the wrapper when the kids were picking it up licking it just to be able to get a taste of something else. Mm -hmm. So when you look at those kind of things, you realize there is a great need, not just here, not just in Randolph County, not just in the United States, but worldwide. And we hope that you can think about that. Now, how many of you are already part of a congregation that is supporting uh, Shoebox Ministry? Well, now, that is great. What I'd love you to do is to go back and tell you the truth that we were very thankful for the participation. We'd like to see them grow it. Obviously, as we go into this new year, our goal in the States is uh, one of the boxes to be uh, packed here. Not to be packed in the United States to be shipped over. Now, there's like eight other countries and nine other countries that also participate in this worldwide. But I'm just focused on the United States numbers. So, if you have a church that's participating, I'm hoping that it might not just be a Sunday school or a women's group or a men's group, but it's a church-wide effort and mission. And if it's not, we have help, and I'm going to introduce them in a moment, to help you to be able to come out and talk to your congregation, share with them some of the excitement they have, and maybe even get a speaker who has received a shoebox to talk with them also, which is really dramatic thought process when you see it and hear it. But we really would like to help grow that as best we can. Now for those who did not raise a hand and are not involved in a congregation that has a shoebox ministry, we would love to be able to show you how to start one. And there's a table over here when you leave, there's some handouts if you want them. But it's because it's done and been working so well, it's excuse me, not, not a lot of energy and creative trade creativity needs to go into it. It's all laid out. But what you need to do, almost all the materials are free. It's not something you have to spend a lot of money on. You have to spend some time. But so many people want to be missionaries, like to do a missionary outreach, but they can't for a variety of reasons. What better way from your church, home, or your own home to pack a shoebox and realize that when you send this, you're doing the same thing as a missionary doing out in the field. And quite frankly, those missionaries need it to be able to use this as a source to grow and share the word. And as you're probably aware, and I don't know the numbers, I was trying to get them, I couldn't find them, but you know, Christians are being martyred all around the world. Not here. I don't know how many have died here in the United States, okay, for in the last two years. And I haven't heard of that many that died sharing their love of Christ. But they are dying. And it's a, there's a war going on. <coughs> And we need to figure out how can we stop the war and turn the tide. And that's really what we're thinking about as we go through this evening. We want to ask you to see if you can look and see how we can continue to grow in your congregations or start new ones.